Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Issues and Answers, Civic Engagement. I'm Fred Martino. Across the country, people are working to encourage citizens to get involved. Low voter turnout and difficulty getting people to run for office have been challenges for a long time. But there's also reason for hope. This year's women's marches in January were organized around the theme, Power to the Polls. The goal, one million new registered voters by November, and more women are running for office. A Rutgers University study of candidates who filed or are likely to run shows a record 50 women running for Senate, 396 running for a seat in the House. But along with the hope, there's this record lows in those expressing high confidence in American institutions. A Marist, NPR, and PBS NewsHour poll found 43% confidence in the presidency, 36% in the Democratic Party, just 30% in the media, 29% for the Republican Party, and only a quarter had high confidence in Congress. Amid those numbers, though, some young people in our region are not deterred. As Michael Hernandez reports, they are working to increase civic engagement and voter turnout in our area. Getting young people to vote is easier said than done, but university students from Texas and New Mexico are trying. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau shows about 46% of voters aged 18 to 29 cast ballots in the 2016 presidential election. That's compared to 59% of people 30 to 44 years old, 67% of those aged 45 to 64, and 71% of voters 65 and older. University of Texas at El Paso Student Government Association Attorney General Sergio Olivas Jr. says we can do better. I feel that, you know, from 1776 people have been, been fighting for our right to vote. I feel that, and not only abroad but also domestically and in a lot of, you know, civic issues, you know, it took us amendments just to even expand our right to vote. So I feel like to not vote, I feel it would be an insult to the work that it's been done. That's why Olivas joined Doniana County's Election Advisory Council, a nonpartisan volunteer group founded by the county clerk's office in 2015 to promote involvement in elections. The council aims to increase democratic engagement by helping people register to vote, distributing election information, and educating citizens about why voting matters. The membership ha hasn't reflected most of the younger age population. And so my hope is that, well, if we can at least get a couple of volunteers to attend some of these meetings or maybe organize something independently of their own to encourage young voters to get out to vote, I think that would be excellent. NMSU communications disorder student Amanda Lamberti says until last year she had not voted, but now she's involved. I guess if I were speaking to my 18-year-old self, I would get more involved with the politics just because um, as time goes by and as I get older, it's going to affect, it will affect me or the students who are going to vote later. Lamberti says with important decisions being made on issues like health care and immigration, voting is essential. But that won't convince everyone. Lamberti's classmate Samantha Homan says she didn't participate in the presidential election because she's politically neutral. I've not really ever been a fan of what it brings out in people, especially the latest election. But my, I come from a family that has always voted and has always talked about politics. Um, I, just, I just did not vote this year simply because I could not <laughs> see which choice I would probably want to make there. Low voter turnout isn't just a youth issue, it's a problem across all demographics. About 11% of voters in Las Cruces participated in the city's municipal elections in 2017. That's up from the 8% turnout in similar elections in 2013, but still low enough for students like Olivas to take action. When our generation's vo voter turnout is in the single digits, it's unacceptable. We've, we've got to change it.
Oliva suggests making the voting process more exciting so people won't feel like it's a chore. Maybe having a, a, a fun day at the park where people can actually, you know, celebrate the fact that we can go out to vote. Personally, for me, I would like to see Election Day as a, as a national holiday, but, um, you know, without the, the passing of legislation or anything, I think we have to operate within the current system. And so if we can get people excited about going out to vote, then that could help. To help with the council's initiative in New Mexico, Olivas reached out to his friend, Joshua Gandaria, who is studying government at NMSU. Gandaria says more work needs to be done to educate students on how electing local and state officials directly impacts them. If we can engage younger people, um, not only, you know, not only uh, register them to vote, but also um, engage with them in a way that we educate them on why it is important to vote, then that can uh, help us move towards a more uh, positive uh, voting, uh, voting future, I guess we could say. Gondaria says the council, which plans to visit schools across Doniana County to register students to vote, is still recruiting volunteers. We have uh, quite a bit of people out and I know of, of more that are, that are still to uh, join us. So we're in that stage of, uh, you know, kind of organizing everyone. And as soon as uh, that stage is set, then we'll actually go out and uh, engage with people. So. They won't need to engage Samantha Holman. She says she wishes she would have voted in 2016 and now plans to vote this fall. I do regret not voting just because I think it's kind of the dumbest thing I could have done because that means I didn't get a voice this election, but I do plan on voting next election. And many hope a lot more college students and others vote in the fall. This year's women's marches across the country were organized around the theme, Power to the Polls, with a goal of registering one million new voters by November. For KRWG, I'm Michael Hernandez. Later in the show, Michael returns with reports on civic engagement at public meetings, and he'll take us to a Las Cruces exhibit related to the topic. Now I would like to introduce our panel. On my left, Alex Luna is a community organizer with NM Cafe, and Kim Sorensen is the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Las Cruces. On my right, Doniana County Clerk Scott Kraling and Las Cruces City Councilor Gabe Vasquez. Thank you all for being with us today on the program. Appreciate you being here. Scott, I, I want to begin with you uh, in addition to the uh, Election Advisory Council, and I should disclose I'm a member of that. I'm also a member of the League, and we work together to encourage people to register to vote, to get out there and vote. Your office has been doing a lot of different things. In that story, we saw an event uh, I had a chance to participate with you uh, in at Centennial High School registering young people to vote, but also speaking to classes, telling uh, young people about the importance of, of voting. It was a great event. You're registering a lot of uh, young people at, at high schools and doing other things. Tell me about the efforts. Well, for, for me, it's, uh, you know, the ship is sailing through the middle of the ocean. And while I want to build it and make it stronger, um, we also have to recognize the fact that it's sailing and we don't want it to sink. And so the efforts that we organize right now in our high schools are, 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 the, are keeping it sailing. Right? We're going into to the schools, uh, we're, we're, we're working with our advisory council to, to make sure that we get into every high school throughout the entire county and, 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 and offer students an opportunity to register to vote. Some of those opportunities we can get into the classroom and we can talk about it. Some of those opportunities, they're not quite as successful because they're, you, know, you can go at lunchtime and be in the cafeteria. Um, and so to me, that's, that's the, the, the ship sailing through the ocean. We gotta keep it, we can't let it sink. And the long term, I'd like to see, and, and I'm actually, I'm working with Las Cruces Public School District, um, the League of Women Voters, on a, on a much larger civic engagement program that can be implemented um, starting in kindergarten, going all the way through, uh, the, all the way through graduation. And, and the group has the goal of making sure that every graduating senior who's eligible is registered to vote before they leave school. And so that's, that's our long term goal, is, is, just, is just getting everyone, leave the public school um, um, system with that knowledge of why elections matter and, and ready to do it. Yeah, I remember that event and how exciting it was and, and recently uh, connected to that event we were talking about the fact that the legislature uh, had passed a law that allowed 17 year olds to vote in primaries if they were going to be 18 at the time of the general election. And of course, that's assuming they're registered with a party because we don't have an open primary in 
in New Mexico. I want to quickly ask you about that because a lot of people think that this would increase civic engagement if folks who do not register with a party had a chance to participate in the primaries. And of course, some say it's a, a legal issue. We're helping to pay for those primaries. Shouldn't we be able to participate if we're not registered with the party? Well, it's, you know, it's a state law, and so it's up to the legislature to determine what, what that should look like. Um, uh, from my perspective, I think that we would have more people participating in the process if the pool of eligible voters was bigger, and that's just obvious to me. And so, um, I, so, so the idea of opening primaries up to, um, to people who are not registered with major political parties is a good idea. What format that looks like is, uh, I, you know, I'm not quite settled in my own personal perspective on that, um, because there are a lot of options. Um, a lot of different states do it in different ways. Um, and, and again, it's really the state legislature that has to make the final call, and then ultimately the governor um, to sign off on, on, on whatever passes. And so, um, but, but definitely, the larger the pool of people who are, who are, who are eligible to vote, um, the bigger the turnout's gonna be. Okay. Gabe, this is your first elected office. You knocked, I know, on a lot of doors to get elected, and later in the show we're gonna see you at a community meeting. You yep. keep people engaged in the community by meeting with them, having uh, public officials come to talk with them. Give me your views on this about how we get more people, not only young people, but everyone out there excited about voting, registered to vote always, and always voting, too. Well, um, I, I think we got to meet people where they're at, right? And I think part of the model of local government has always been come into my office and we can talk about the issues that matter to you. Uh, my model in, in my time as a city council will be to go out into the communities, go out into the district and talk to people where they're at and make it easier for them uh, to speak up about the issues in their communities and then to provide real solutions and to bring decision makers to the table at those meetings where they can actually figure out how the process works so that they're not just feeling like they're talking into the wind but they're talking to people who uh, have an impact in the issues that they're worried about. So um, it really matters. I mean, uh, you, you heard from um, our great county clerk here who's a great example of why local elections matter because he's going out of his way. It's not part of his job description to do what he's doing. He's doing it because this is part of his vision for the county clerk's office. Similarly, uh, for me as a city councilor, my vision is to meet the community where they're at. And those campaign promises that I made when I was knocking on those doors, I have them written down in my office. And so um, in the next four years, my plan is to go through each one of those and go try to make those happen. And I thought about those before I campaigned because what I wanted to do was engage the voters of this district in a meaningful enough way where throughout the next four years of me serving on the city council, they can see the progress that, they, that I told them that we were gonna see. And so I think that lets them be part of the solution, but also keeps them engaged and restores their faith, hopefully in elected officials to say, hey, you know, if somebody comes knocking at my door and asking for my vote, that I actually have a voice in what's gonna happen uh, if they are representing me in, in local government. And so I think that's a huge part of it, right, is, is meeting folks where they're at, making realistic promises, and keeping uh, th those folks engaged. And so for me, my campaign is not just, you know, the six months I spent knocking on doors before I got elected, but it's the next four years. And if I keep that mindset of, of, of having to consistently engage with my community, I think we can be successful and we'll create more voters in the process. Okay, Kim, uh, we work together on candidate forums, uh, KRWG, I'm, I'm proud to say, is one of the most active public media organizations in the country in terms of providing candidate forums. We have done scores of these together. Uh, tell me uh, about your thoughts on this. We, we hear very often from people that one of the reasons they don't vote is they don't feel they are equipped with enough knowledge about the candidates. Yeah, I'm hearing the same thing. Um, and I actually, I asked a couple of students the other day um, that same question, why don't, you know, what, what would give you incentive to vote? And um, a lot of it is they feel that they don't know enough. Um, they don't know where to get the information. Um, voting needs to be easier for them. Um, so I think that we need to really um, emphasize, you know, what the league is trying to do, uh, emphasize the importance of voting, you know, from, and emphasize civic, civic engagement in the schools. Um, you know, 
It's interesting because I read a, just read this morning, you know, for 33 years, the Gallup poll has been giving a survey on, you know, to Americans, what, what is the focus, what should be the focus of schools? And the majority of Americans have consistently said, educating our youth to be good citizens. Um, and yet, another survey um, had 70% of teachers polling saying they've had to de-emphasize social studies and civic engagement in order to focus more on math, science, and reading um, to bring test scores up. Mm -hmm. So that seems to be a disconnect to me. So, so I'd like to see, um, and uh, the um, League of Women Voters Youth Engagement Committee is working on, uh, along with the Election Advisory Council and um, working on bringing more civic engagement back into the schools. And you're also, I know, surveying young people to find out uh, what would make them go out and vote. Why don't they vote if they exactly. don't Exactly. So this is important. Mm -hmm. I, I think research is very important. I had a chance to do some uh, local uh, research here on what people want from the media, and I was, it was fascinating to find out through uh, focus groups with public media members and non-members alike, they not only feel that educating people about elections and public policy is a good thing, they say it's a responsibility of the media, and I couldn't agree more with that. Alex, you work as a uh, community organizer with NM Cafe, and this shows the incredible power of community engagement. Your group collected um, petition signatures that led to an increase in Las, the Las Cruces minimum wage. Mm -hmm. Tell me at this time in, a, in our nation's history, which uh, a lot of people have been talking about over the past couple of years, where you see civic engagement and where you see this going. You know, right now, currently in civic engagement, I, how I feel in terms of things that are dynamic right now is this right now has become really transactional and really focused folks are identifying voting voting for a solution and identifying that with a candidate. Uh, with ideally is that all we're, I feel in some cases that we focus around just turnout, 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 um, as a way of this is how we're gonna solve um, all the injustice that are happening in our society and our community. Uh, but within that, a lot of organizing, organizing is also a key tactic and tool that is important to follow up after, after elections in terms of creating accountability. So essentially people, you're trying to, to put the focus on issues, not just candidates. We hear yeah. this a lot, that part of the problem with our political system is people may vote for a candidate simply because they identify with the candidate and not even necessarily agree with their stance on certain really important issues. Yeah. You know, and that's, I think that's one of the most important things to lift up as well, too, because people are about issues. Um, and in this space and time, you know, and when people just associating just one issue and just picking one thing that a candidate likes or another candidate is saying that they stand for this issue, you're not getting a full understanding about what a person's values and belief system is. So that's why for us as, as Scafe, it's not only just meeting, meeting people where they're at, as, as Gabe said earlier, but I think the most important thing is that the dynamic of people that we're engaging are regularly ignored voters. So these are voters that are not going to be engaged by any political parties because they don't vote generally in any, in any form of election because they feel like their voice is not being heard or they're not being represented, um, especially when they see the impacts of their community um, and the environment that they live is what's more important in that matter a vote or making sure that somebody has, uh, making sure a family isn't being detained or being deported or having food to eat. Like it's prioritizing what, what's at most value and what's at need. Yeah. Um, and right now in this space and time, because voting has become so transactional and just can it centric, um, that we're also leaving about a systemic system that is creating and oppressing people as well. Okay, well we wanna welcome uh, our audience to come to the microphone now and join our conversation. And uh, we do have uh, our first uh, question and comment of the program. Hello. Hello, Dale. Uh, my, my question uh, to all, any of the panelists is, how can you use the newer media like cell phone apps and digital media to encourage people, especially young people who use these uh, kinds of media, to get them involved? 
Okay, thank you very much for that. Thoughts on that? I mean, President Obama, when he was first elected, was credited uh, with using social media, using modern technology, and even more so in his re-election. I'll, I'll jump in. I'll, I'll say that you know the, the social media is a tool that we can use um, to get information into people's hands. Um, but the problem's deeper than than that, and I think that's you know that's really what I think what, what Alex was saying is really agreeing with, is that is that the problem is just much deeper than than people. In, in people not having the, the access to the information. Although, when, when we go out and we talk to people who don't vote on a regular basis, they want a centralized source of information. They want, they want consistency in the election administration. They want to know when they're going to be able to do it. So we need to create a structure that, that, that gives them a, a more, um, more consistency in it. And, and so social media, is, it's just like any other media that's out there. It's a tool yeah. that we can use, but the problem is much deeper, well, and, much deeper than and, just that. And the other side of it too, of course, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of misinformation spread on social media. So in addition to, uh, or I should say, as part of a civics education, we need mid media literacy. Well, we well, we, and we, we absolutely need media literacy, yeah. but we also need to we need to we need to, we need people on the forefront providing good, accurate information. For instance, you know, I think that those of us who are who pay, who pay attention to these subjects, we hear um, frequently about you know Russians hacking voter registration databases, and even the New York Times saying thirty some voter registration databases being hacked by the Russians. And you know, the the facts just don't support those reports, and so it's a problem when we have reputable media organizations spreading bad information about what's going on and because it, it, it destroys the confidence in the system right now you were talking about the confidence in the institutions right now I read a report for 47 percent of the public doesn't have confidence in our elections that's a problem they should there's no reason for them not to have confidence that their votes gonna count especially when it comes to these local elections like you know City Council or County Commission where, where there's pure true democracy and these people have a direct impact on their daily lives Gabe we have another person waiting to, uh, to ask a question, but I want to ask you about another aspect of this. Um, you also, besides community <laughs> meetings as a city council, you get people engaged far beyond the kind of engagement we would ever see on a cell phone. Sure. You are a an advocate for our environment, and you get young people out into our parks and seeing the reason why uh, we have to protect our public lands, you get them out enjoying the public lands. Well, yeah, absolutely, and social media, like Scott said, is a tool, but it's also the reality of how a lot of uh, folks, especially younger people, um, are getting their information today, not just getting information, but also putting out information, right? Because it's, it's not just about the influx of information, but it's also what they put out because that influences their immediate sphere of, of friends or family to either take an action or to take a position or to take an opinion. So, um, you know, the way uh, propaganda, let's say political propaganda was 30 or 40 years ago, right? From primarily through mail or through TV or through the radio. I mean, now people are getting massive amounts of information from all these different sources from folks who don't necessarily have the hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for a TV commercial or to pay for postage on a mailer. So like, like Scott said, the quality of that information has diminished, but we're getting more information out there. And I think the reality is that we have to use that space to our ability and we have to learn how to, uh, in, in a sense, really master, at least within what we're the sphere of, of our audience that we're trying to influence, of how to get that information to them. And I think whether it's an organizer or an elected official, or in my role trying to get young people outside, is, is figuring out how you do that and then to do that effectively. That's a good point. Everyone's yes. different too. Yep. And now uh, another question from the audience. Yes, I'm Erica from Las Cruces, and my passion is to try to get young people to vote. And uh, we often hear about, we need to make it more exciting for young people to vote. And I want to ask you that question, what are you proposing? What do you think are good ideas? I've heard pizza parties, I've heard giving out movie tickets. Well, giving out movie tickets to me almost sounds like buying your vote. Is that really even legal? So what ideas do you guys have in, to make it more exciting and attractive for young people to vote? Alex, let me start with you on this one because you are a community organizer. You have to get people do, to do a lot more than just go out and vote, yeah. right? I mean, you have to get them to collect petition signatures, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. which led to 
a, a huge a change in the city of Las Cruces, a, a minimum wage law. Uh, and you have to get people to do a lot of different things that, you know, advocate for certain policy goals. Yeah. What, what do you think? What should we do to get people more involved? I don't know. That movie ticket idea sounds pretty <laughs> exciting. Um, Depending on the movie, right? <laughs> uh, no, I, I would say, like, one of the things that, that's really important in this as well, too, is that people don't act out of their own, like, they act with their self-interest and intact, right? And, and within that, too, is, like, what, what identifying identifying people's self-interest creates an opportunity for folks to be able to further engage when they see themselves connected to what's happening. Like, it's, like I said earlier, if it's connected to a candidate, people don't see themselves within, within another candidate in terms of that, but they can identify, you know what, what's interest to them, who do they love, um, and in terms of their values and going out to vote their values when it comes down to it as well too. Storytelling is one of the most important things and naturally, Naturally, when we build relationship with one another, we know each other's stories, we know each other's values, hopes, and dreams. And because this system has um, this dynamic of, of democracy and right now civic engagement is so transactional about we need to turn out a mass scale, that you're missing the, the quality of type of conversation that you have with people. Um, and that's what I would say, like storytelling is, is one of the most important things, and as well as what their self-interest is and what their vision is. Are there other thoughts on how to get people uh, interested in voting? Oh, sorry. Kim, um, go ahead. Well, again, I'm, I'm just gonna go back to the schools again. I mean, if, when I talked to um, a group of young people the other day and asked them, you know, did you discuss current issues or, or current events or um, did you read the newspaper or, you know, what, what, what did you get in the schools? And, and many of them said, I don't remember getting anything like that in the school. So I think that connecting, um, connecting what our local officials do and how that relates to their quality of life is really important. I'm glad you said that because, mm -hmm. uh, boy, when I was in school, I remember the power of that when teachers did that, when they talked about, hey, what we're learning now, here's how it relates to something that's actually happening in our community. Uh, we saw a video earlier of uh, an event at Centennial High School where we were registering people to vote, but we also had a chance to talk to classes. And one of the things I said when I was talking to the students there is, hey, you know what, there are a lot of decisions that impact the fact that you're in a brand new school building mm -hmm. right here, that you, you know, that the funding was allocated in order to build this facility and to also have the kind of quality education that you can have here in, a, in our schools. Scott, you had something else to add on this? I was just gonna say that, you know, I don't, I don't know that any of us are the people to answer the question of how do we get young people excited and interested in it because we're not young people. And so, you know, it's, a, it's exciting to see the report where Sergio and Joshua are being interviewed. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely excited about the effort that they're putting together with our Youth Election Advisory Council because that's who we need to hear from. We need to hear directly from them to understand exactly what it is that they're looking for, to find out well, what the problem is and right. do an analysis. Gabe, you spend time, though, with young people, uh, as I mentioned earlier, going out into uh, our parks and showing them the value of protecting our environment. Do you get a sense that that has an impact on that? I do, and first I want to rebut uh, Scott's uh, previous <laughs> comment that there's no young people on this panel. <laughs> I'm technically you. within one year, I am a millennial within one year, um, <laughs> and, and, and I choose to say that um, right, in certain situations. Uh, no, but, but really, I mean, um, so for some of the, the young folks that we take out to the parks, um, or, or we take out to the special places that surround us here in Las Cruces, um, it's 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 the experience is really important to them but why and how they experience it is all different and so um, while somebody might have their their toes you know dug into the dirt and they're trying to figure out what minerals are in the soil there's somebody else taking a picture of a flower and there's another student looking at um, a horned lizard and so those are three potentially different reasons for being outside different interests and so like Alex said you know you have to look at what the what the interests are of youth what they're going through at that particular time what matters to them um, 
there's some policy I'm working at at the city level which has the potential to impact a large degree of New Mexico State University students in the future and if I'm confident that if I come on campus and I did during my election and I have since then and talk about this issue that we'll get folks engaged because all of a sudden we're talking about something that's relevant to their yeah. to their daily lives and so for, for in my experience is, is you you really have to figure out what the young people want and then yeah. and then address those yeah. issues and showing the power of yep. exactly. I know I've seen photos of you holding fish so you also get a meal out of it when you go out there <laughs> that's no yes that's right <laughs> that's right all right well another report from KRWG now Las Cruces has been making strides in civic engagement city councilors like Gabe holding regular community meetings and the Brannigan Cultural Center recently unveiled an interactive exhibit asking people to give their take on important aspects of the city Michael Hernandez has more uh, our staff and uh, our police officers here to please introduce yourselves so that uh, so that we know how to address you. Being proactive in the community is the basis of civic engagement and a functioning democracy. That's why Las Cruces residents and District 3 City Councilor Gabe Vazquez gathered for a town hall at Lynn Middle School. Vazquez, who was elected last November, held the first of what he says is a series of meetings to address community issues. He invited newly hired police chief Patrick Gallagher and a handful of officers to speak about public safety, which Vazquez says was one of his district's biggest concerns during his campaign. There's been a lot of property crime, some violent crime, uh, burglaries, and a lot of it unfortunately has happened in this part of this district. And so when I was thinking about what should I do for my first community meeting, it was a no-brainer to me as we have to address these immediate concerns that people have. Uh, and, and it gives us an opportunity to bring out our new police chief so he can meet the residents of this district um, who are, uh, in my opinion, probably being disproportionately impacted by some of these, uh, these crime issues here. Being a good steward to the community is Kat Sanchez's goal. She and her partner live in the neighborhood with their four children. Sanchez says she attended the forum because public safety is a top priority for her as a parent and district member. It's important for us to take responsibility because we're part of the community. It's not just one person's responsibility, it's not the government's, it's not just the police officers, it's everybody's responsibility. Thousands of women nationwide participated in January marches for the second year in a row. Sanchez, who works for the women's organization Young Women United, says she and her family protested as part of their civic duty. She says getting involved matters because it's easy to complain, it's more difficult to take action. As a female, as a Latina, a Chicana, it's also our responsibility to run for these elections. Um, if we want to make sure that there's diversity in in the city government, if we want to make sure that there's diversity at every level, we need to make sure that we're a part of that and we've got to be visible and we've got to go out there and run for office as well. Civic engagement isn't limited to attending public meetings, it's about interacting with the community. And that's the aim of the Brannigan Cultural Center's new exhibit, What's Your Las Cruces? The museum wants to hear more stories from residents about the city's history, culture, and identity. The center is asking people to share their family photographs and objects to add to the display and post on social media. Curator Norma Hartel has sectioned the exhibit into five stations that showcase important people, places, and items of the Mesilla Valley. We have um, some protest posters that we are hanging up so to encourage people to, you know, maybe bring their own posters or pictures of uh, community activism that they have done. Um, we have also five different objects in our object section uh, that includes a dress, a military jacket, a metate, a bracelet, and that's just to encourage people to tell a story of objects that they may have of Las Cruces. Community participation is key to growing the exhibit. Hartel says the museum wants to preserve the stories of people living in the Mesquite Day Historic District to Mesilla. She says heritage is important, and when people bring in objects like the Matate, which is a mortar and pestle, it tells a more complete story of the region. It's symbolic to a lot of Latino communities because that's where you grind your corn, and essentially for my family, that's where you'd make your tortillas from. <laughs> One of the museum's visitors is Stevie Paz. Paz was born and raised in Las Cruces and graduated from New Mexico State University. Paz says art has been a fixture in her life since she was a child. So I'm Mexican, I was raised here in Las Cruces and a lot of it is mostly religious art. So my grandmother had 
fixtures of uh, the Lady of Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary, you know, all throughout the house, statues, everything like that. So I grew up pretty normal, normalized to those types of religious art. Paz works at NM Cafe, a faith-based community activist group. She says she was drawn to the display's political theme. Oh, what sticks out about it is, you know, um, my coworker Joana Bencomo is featured in the activism piece of the exhibit, and I think it portrays, you know, a lot of women that are getting involved in activism, politics, you know, especially in the climate that we're in, and it's important for women of color, you know, to have that voice and to have, you know, opinions about what's going on and to be able to express that. Vazquez says for him, civic engagement includes following up on the pledges he made to residents during his campaign and listening to their concerns. And that's what keeps people engaged because once they don't believe or have trust in their elected officials, then they, they become more reluctant to engage because they believe that their voice doesn't matter. Meetings like this allow voices to be heard and some hope more people will also be heard at the ballot box. Women's marches this year use the theme Power to the Polls with a goal of registering one million new voters. For KRWG, I'm Michael Hernandez. Thank you, Michael. And Michael will be back coming up a little later in our show with another report on ways more people are getting involved in our community. And yes, uh, a big part of that is voting, but there are a lot of other things, especially working on issues that we wanna talk about and we have talked about during the show. If you are just joining us, this is Issues and Answers, Civic Engagement. And we're also taking audience questions. We have another one. Hi. Hello, my name's Tom Biglin. I'm from Las Cruces. And this is a, I'm going probably maybe a step outside of what your topic has been a little bit today, but when you talk about people being interested and get their heart burning for um, engaging, that oftentimes it's the political scene that gets people engaged. And I'm curious that, to tell the truth, Mr. Kraling and Mr. Vasquez, I wouldn't want to work for, you know, go out with the county or the city because I'm very, very strong in a particular political, and I won't mention any particular um, party in, in this one, but go Bernie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, and probably, Ms. Swanson, that I, I, I wouldn't step into one of your programs because I don't want to register the other party members. I want to register my party members and with that being an area of my interest and I think a lot of people's interest, then um, I would just like your opinion on that. And I know also just being that we're here with a nonprofit radio um, station and Alex, um, particularly, I've, I've volunteered for CAFE so I know a little bit about it. They walk a fine line as a nonprofit because they have goals they a lot of times have no which particular voting group would most likely support those goals, but as a non, they have problems in that area. So my pro, my question, how do you, okay, how would you engage me? Okay, so that that's a great question. So I, I wanted to clarify exactly what you were curious about. So basically, how would you engage someone who has very strong views in terms of supporting a particular candidate or a particular uh, idea that very often doesn't get a lot of attention. That's right. Right? That's okay. right. And, so yeah, let, me, let me start with Alex on that because I think this is a really important point, right? Because very often uh, we do see uh, a situation and a lot of people uh, who during the, during the uh, race for the Democratic nomination for president, a lot of people felt, for instance, that Bernie Sanders did not get the same attention uh, that, that Hillary Clinton got and that that was part of uh, what happened in the nominating process. But this also relates to issues. A lot of people feel that incredibly important issues are completely or mostly ignored uh, by the media. Uh, how does this impact things and how do, you, how do you then turn it around, as he asked, and get those folks who feel disenfranchised to pay attention? So as a, as a 504c3, you know, in terms of the, 
how Bernie was represented in terms of the, demo, the Democratic um, nomination that matter. Like I, I cannot speak to that as well too as, yeah, and as we should, Cafe. So we should explain um, that. You're, you're yeah. nonpartisan. Yeah, so you we, deal with issues, yeah. but not with candidates. Yes. But, but to get to, that, to the broader issue, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who, the reason they identify with Bernie Sanders, with Elizabeth Warren, with a lot of uh, other politicians, is they feel disenfranchised. And I know um, probably some of the people that signed the petition uh, to get the minimum wage increase that your group was involved with felt that issue was ignored. No. And they had to take action because mm -hmm. the people they elected uh, or didn't elect, if they didn't vote, weren't, they weren't taking action on their own. Yeah, and part of that with, with issues that, that are currently being spoken up, especially one of our primary focus right now is around immigration, is that there is this, uh, this um, non-human aspect to what's happened to, to policies and issues that are happening right now. So part of what we engage folks is to be able to work on these policies to, create, to humanize these issues, especially when we have these narratives and like examples of like the Albuquerque Journal um, presenting a false representations of dreamers. Um, how do you create this space where these stories and people coming to engage are sharing stories um, and speaking truth to what's happening to the issues and reality? That's what I would also say, like in terms of what, what um, like in terms of you have two types of strategies that are happening, those that in terms are, are photo focused and rooted in data-oriented messaging and framing that this is proven to work that institutions like Democrats and Republicans use. Um, and then you have this populist uh, tort of rhetoric that is focused around lifting up pain um, that you've heard around like when Bernie Sanders, even towards President Trump, was talking about these stories about how people are being robbed and being stripped um, and identifying that these, these are the bigger entities that are stripping and robbing the wealth. But what came in as well in those places where you had a racialized narrative of, of Trump saying that these are people of color, immigrants that are actually stealing your jobs, that are actually creating a violent, violent and unsafe communities, which is a lie. And then you have also the other stance as well, Bernie Sanders talking about again, the race, the race aspect of when you talk about marginalization and disenfranchisement, that it's happening to predominantly people of color. And within those, actually lifting up stories as well that solidifies that this is the experience that's actually happening. Okay. Um, we have another story that I want to play in just a moment, but Kim, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this because just like CAFE, the League of Women Voters is nonpartisan. You do not endorse uh, candidates, but you do issue positions on uh, public policy issues. You even do research on public mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. to form a, a, a position. So. Exactly. Is this part of the answer to answer his question to get the people who feel disenfranchised uh, actually more involved in voting? I think so. Um, I mean, throughout my whole life, I, I have never been involved in a political party per se. I have always worked on issues. That's all, you know, I identify an issue that I care a lot about and I will work on that issue. Um, and I think that's, that's what drew me to um, the League of Women Voters is because they are nonpartisan, but they really believe that in order for democracy to work, you have to have an educated citizenry who is engaged. And, um, and, and to me, you know, you need to be educated on the issues and identify the issues that you care about and then find the candidates or whatever who are aligned with those issues. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure I understand the, his question because I've never felt disenfranchised um, or not inclined to vote because you know I, I, I find the candidates who are Okay. thinking the way I do. <laughs> Gabe, I'll let you weigh in on real quickly on this, and sure, then we've got sure. a, another story. Thank you, Fred. Well, um, I, at first I want to say that I canvassed for Bernie Sanders in Virginia for <laughs> several months, and so uh, the re part of the reason I want to say that is because as a community, we have to get to know each other better. And in my other job that I, I work for, that. yes, <laughs> and, and, and that's why we have to get to know each other better, because 
uh, this, this, this dual party uh, system that we have allows us to compartmentalize and box in, especially candidates, into uh, these ideologies that uh, are supposed to, you know, kind of tenets of each party. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just not the case. That's the system that we have to work in. Uh, but, uh, but again, I think we have to get to know each other better. We have to get to know candidates based on the issues that are important to you. And for me, working in my other job at, at a C3, uh, it takes me to places like Southeast and Southwest New Mexico. And say where, what that job is. For the New Mexico Wildlife Federation. And okay. so uh, when I go out and talk, for example, to folks um, who depend on oil and gas uh, jobs and in my organization, you know, we're trying to transition away from the fossil fuel industry into uh, renewable energy. We also have to take into consideration that those are jobs. And if we don't have a plan to replace them, then it's not responsible for us to go and try to shut those industries down without a viable replacement to get those people jobs. And so part of that is about going to those communities, meeting people where they're at, finding out what uh, what interests them and and, and then in, and then having them engage and now they're more willing to talk with somebody from the, an opposing party with and an opposing point me, of view let me be bold here uh, is, is also part of this demanding that the media focus on issues absolutely absolutely I mean uh, you know I started out my career working in newspapers and part of the reason I did was because I wanted to be that fourth estate I wanted to hold politicians and I wanted to hold the powers that be accountable and what I quickly realized is that um, that didn't matter so much to the folks who were at the top of the food chain making that revenue from the advertisement. A lot of it was all about, you know, what do the readers, what gets the most clicks? And that's become, unfortunately, the model of media, modern media today is uh, what gets the most money for advertisement, what gets the most views. And oftentimes, that's not the substantive policy discussions that we need to be having. It's, the, it's, it's everything else. All right. Thanks, Kane. Yep. We have another uh, question from the audience coming up, but first, another KRWG report on ways our region is becoming more engaged. This is really exciting. The Las Cruces Public Schools has a student advisory committee to the school board, so young people aren't just learning about government, they're part of it. Michael Hernandez reports. These Las Cruces high school students have a seat on the Board of Education. It's the only seat like it in the state. Founded in 2015, the Student Advisory Council gives select Las Cruces high school students the opportunity to provide input and voice concerns to the district superintendent and Board of Education. Those concerns include lowering the number of standardized tests and preventing student suicides. Centennial High School junior Cameron Castillo is the Student Advisory Council chair. Castillo joined in 2016 and says he hopes more students take advantage of the council's unique position to address policy. I think every student should have the opportunity to have a voice here in this district. They need to be able to realize that everything that is decided down here could directly impact them in some way, shape, or form. And I hope that students will be able to recognize the work that we do and with that provide us with more input and advice that we can go on to relay to the decision makers down here. About two dozen student representatives from six of seven high schools in the Las Cruces Public Schools make up the Student Advisory Council. Meetings are held the day of school board public sessions. The partnership gives students like Mayfield High School senior and vice chair Thomas Wilkinson the chance to attend board meetings and directly report what matters to the roughly 25,000 students in the district. It's Wilkinson's first year on the council. He says he wishes more students would get involved like he did. I didn't know what I was getting into. When I first got here, it was, my mind was blown, assuming the leadership role of taking what the students have to say in just my school in general and bringing it here is something proud I'm able to say that I'm able to do. Recently, Castillo says that the council began studying the potential safety effects of allowing security guards to carry concealed weapons on campus in case of an active shooter. He says serving on the council makes him feel a greater sense of responsibility to his classmates. I'll tell you what, it makes me feel even more responsible for relaying the messages that I hear from my peers every day when I go to class to the decision makers down here both on the school board and in the office of the superintendent. It makes me feel a greater responsibility for doing so. Students interested in representing their high school must be recommended by their principal before being interviewed by the council chair and sponsor. For KRWG, I'm Michael Hernandez. Think those young people are going to vote and get involved in issues? I sure do. That is a fantastic program. Congratulations to those young people and to our schools uh, for getting young people engaged. Uh, this is what it's all about. We have another uh, question from the audience. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's Karen, and 
I live in Las Cruces, just moved here last September, and of course, one of the first things I did was to register. Uh, I can identify a lot with those young people in that, you know, I just look at my voter registration card and I've got it, I, it's like four or five different places and things, that, you know, city, city council, different number for uh, the state, a different number for the uh, state rep and, and the Senate. So it, it's sort of daunting in some ways, but the thing that also has struck me as I've learned more is that it, the good thing about Las Cruces is that so much of it is citizen driven. Um, are, and so there are a lot more positions that actually are available to be filled by people running for those offices, which makes it more challenging because I say, what? I, someone asked me to sign up for or, or sign their petition to be, a, I think it was a utility committee member. I said, what did they do? Why are you running for this? And so what I'm asking for perhaps is some clarity about what people do in these different positions and do they get paid or is it a per diem or what? Um, I recently learned that in fact the, the state's legislature is not a salaried position. Is that true? Yes, that's so, right. You get a I per mean, diem. There are all of these things that are still needing education and I think the more of that kind of information that can be readily shared right down to the, to the you know, drilling down to the very basics would be really helpful for me and for the young people who would think would they'd it, like to. Would it also be helpful as a new resident of the mm -hmm. area to have uh, elections consolidated so yes. that they're all in, yes, okay. <laughs> Uh, Scott, you feel passionately <laughs> yeah. about this one. You actually, you took a position on this. You, you lobbied for this. You said, hey, look, we need, we need to make sure that uh, we, we consolidate elections. There are too many elections. Yeah, it's really complicated. It's a complicated system. And so I think that um, you know, the, the comments that, that she was making are, are right on. It's, it's difficult to figure out what's going on. And so when we when we talk to infrequent voters or people that don't vote on a regular basis, it's these these it's not surprising that they say I didn't know there was an election. I didn't know where to find the information about the election. I didn't know what we were voting on. I didn't know what they did. I didn't I didn't know I didn't I didn't know I didn't know. I didn't know that I had to vote in February. I didn't know I had to vote in March. I didn't know I had to vote in May. I didn't know that this year there wasn't going to be. It's 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 a fragmented system. And as Kim said earlier, it's a fragmented system that relies on the campaigns for the most part when it comes to informing the citizenry. And so um, we've got we've to change the structure. So that's where consolidating local elections comes in, is the idea of taking all these scattered elections that happened throughout the year and putting them all together on one ballot. And, and by the way, um, while yes, there are like 30 different types of organizations throughout the state of New Mexico that fall under this, this effort, locally we're talking about a ballot of five to seven questions. It's not an overwhelming ballot. It's not like the general election ballot. It would be a local election that happens in November of odd number years that way every November if it's an odd numbered year you've got your city council you've got your your school board you've got a special district or two maybe a couple mill levies or bonds right six or seven questions and then in November of even numbered years you've got your traditional general election those are your partisan races and so um, it's not a silver bullet to increasing civic engagement and getting more people to vote but it removes a huge huge hurdle um, that, 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 and, and, and saves resources and so it saves money and it, and it creates a pool of resources that we might be able to tap into to do a better job of informing people yeah. about elections so that not only are we fixing the problem with the fragmented system, but we're also opening up resources for, um, for, for, for county clerks or the Secretary of State's offices to do more outreach into the community to talk to voters about what these elections are, what the races, you know, what the positions do. You know, in California, for instance, everybody, every, when there's an election, every registered voter gets a pack it in the mail and it's you know it's it's like it, it's like a it's like an NMSU you know directory of classes it looks just like that yeah. and it's very informative and it gives everybody the information that they need so that they know what they're doing when they show up to vote in New Mexico there's nothing like that mm -hmm. and so I'd like to I'm, I'm you know I'm putting in my budget a request to try to step up our efforts to do that but the county doesn't have the resources to do that for every election that's out there see I didn't um, know that so it did, there, there's a great example of, a, of the power of programs like this where you have an hour to talk I had was not aware that California 
distributed a mailing like that. And so there's another, another issue where we have an example of an attempt to educate voters. We only have two minutes left, and I want to I wanna ask a really important question. You've been asked this before in a report a couple of years ago, uh, and I want everyone, though, to have a chance to answer this. I also believe in systems, and I believe that if, if the system tells the citizens this is important and it's, it's part of the system, people will be more likely to pay attention. What I'm getting at is not all countries do it this way. Australia, for example, has, as part of citizenship, voting is a requirement. It is mandatory. You get a fine if you don't vote. This is not a new idea in America. We have, you know, of course, jury duty. You can't say, I'm not going to do jury duty. We have jury duty. You got to pay taxes. It's part of citizenship. A lot of people believe voting is so important, it should be part of citizenship. It should be required. Scott, yes or no? Uh, I've got to start it. Um, I, I, don't think that, I don't think that we're at a point in this country where, where mandating voting is going to solve the, the deeper problem. So you say no. Don't I, I think it would be great if, you if, say the, don't I think if we had started from the beginning doing it, it makes sense. Okay, but, not, but, but you can't but there make are, the change. There are industrialized saying. nations around the world that don't have mandatory voting that have much higher much participation higher. So rates there's than other us. ways to do so it. So there's other ways Gabe, to do it. Gabe, should we, is it, I mean, it, it's a responsibility of citizenship. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Should we make it a responsibility, essentially, like jury duty by saying you can't refuse? Yeah, I, I do share Scott's, um, 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 thoughts about at this time I don't think that's going to solve uh, the system is deeply deeply broken and and we can see that both at the local and at the state and at the federal level I think there's a lot of work that we need to do I don't think that this would fix uh, the issues that we have now so at this time I don't think that that's a viable solution not going to work yeah. okay Kim I agree um, I, I don't like being told to do anything so. <laughs> Um, to, to, to tell me that I have to vote, that just doesn't sit well with me, but I think, um, I think we have to consistently send the message from kindergarten, preschool on up through college, degree, you know, all, to, to every citizen that it is our responsibility to be engaged in, in our communities. Alex, what do you think? I, I think it's... I think we're all in agreement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we, when we did a story on this, mm -hmm. it was the same deal. We had a reporter go out and talk to random people on the street, and almost no one said, you should, you should make people do it. And, and let me tell you mm -hmm. something. I, I agree that it would be ideal if we didn't have to do that. But I also know that in countries where you do it, I, Australia being an example, guess what? Just about everybody votes. And guess what, too? Getting to another point that we made earlier, mm -hmm. there's a lot more diversity. It's not just Republican and Democrat. There's a lot more diversity in terms of the power structure. Yeah. Final word on this, Alex. I would, I would say to this, right, if voting wasn't really important, there wouldn't be any type of voter suppression that, to try to disenfranchise people from voting. Mm -hmm. um, and voting is, is an important tool, but it's not the, it's not the end result. Um, in that manner. So that's why I say or, uh, voting without an organizing plan is just voting just to create access and just to make sure that people just come out. But without a, a plan of follow-up and to have a plan of creating something, a vision, a greater vision for our community, um, then all we're just going to be talking about is, is how can we increase turnout, 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 instead of saying how can we really shift the culture. Mm -hmm. That is, that is um, that is creating and people to witness their value um, and to witness the full their full selves. All right. Well, I'm out of time. Alex, thank you so much. Thanks to our entire panel. That's Issues and Answers Civic Engagement. And thank you to you for making public media possible. It is probably not a surprise that research shows more civically engaged people are more likely to donate to public media. If you are not a member, we encourage you to become one at krwg.org. We always encourage you to register to vote and vote. You'll see it at the bottom of our website too, a way to link to voting uh, right on our website. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.